We are in the thick of the Contender Series season, not to mention we got PFL, Road to UFC, and Fury FC also going down this weekend, and the best place for you to get footage on all these competitors competing on these upcoming cards is on the MMA Fight Archive. We're closing in on 2,100 fighter profiles, close to 50 subscribers signed up since the drop of the Fight Archive as well. If you want to try it out for a free 7-day trial, check the link in the description below. There's a reason the top cappers, coaches, and commentators are using this service to ensure they are conveying and analyzing these fights as best as possible so they can get as best of a prediction guess or breakdown of the upcoming matchup so if you want to do that as well if you like doing your own predicting breaking down and analyzing fights that's the best way to do it to ensure you get as much footage on all of these fighters in preparation for their upcoming matchups check the link in the description below for a seven day free trial now let's get right into the episode Welcome to another episode of the MMA Lockcast. I'm your host, Manpreet, aka MMA Lock of the Night, and your boy on social media at MMA L O T N. This week, we're going over UFC Singapore, which is headlined by a featherweight matchup between Max Blessed Holloway and the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung. Very intriguing matchup there between, like I said, featherweights, guys that are trying to get their footing inside the division after coming up short against Alexander Volkanovsky a couple times, but still very entertaining fighters. And I'm excited to see that matchup we got anthony smith rematching ryan span in the co-main event for some reason but also there is a very pivotal flyweight matchup on this card and that's between aaron blanchfield and tyler santos which could determine the next number one contender for the t title that's being competed uh, for in September between uh, Alexa Grasso champion and the former champion Valentina Shevchenko. Reminder, the main card starts at 8 p or eight a.m. Eastern time on Saturday. I believe prelims are at 5 or 4 a.m. So if you're uh, an early bird or want to pull the all-nighter and watch the fights in the morning, just remember that it is Saturday morning and not Saturday evening as they usually are. Uh, before we get into the breakdowns, let's quickly do the recap for last week's UFC 292 card, mainly for the lock of the night and dog of the night predictions. Lock of the night prediction obviously comes through very easily with uh, Gregory Rodriguez going out there and dummying Dennis Tulelian. We also go 2-0 on the regional scene for lock of the night plays, which now increases our lock of the night predictions for the year to 70 and 21 for a 77% hit rate. Fully appreciate everybody that's been telling that and sending the the you know the thank yous and being appreciative of all the work we put into those so a shout out to all you guys in terms of the dog of the night not really going the best right now uh i believe last week's was um uh, it, it's escaping my mind at this moment in time, but it lost. It, it, it was it was a uh, Marina Moroz. Uh, she was not she was not doing too bad until she ended up getting caught in that choke at the ending of the first round. But that comes as an L. We also took some L's on the regional scene in terms of the dog of the night uh, predictions. A little bit of a slump with the dog of the night predictions right now, so I'm not feeling too hot about it. But right now we're at 37 and 54 for a 41 percent hit rate on the dog of the night for the 2023 uh, season. Uh, Remember, if you guys want to get PFL and Road to UFC breakdowns, which go down, PFL goes down Wednesday, Road to UFC goes down Sunday morning. If you want my predictions on those, you can check it out on the Patreon link in the description below, breaking down every single matchup, giving you a best prediction, best prop, and best hedge for every single matchup. Check it out. I put my all into it, and I uh, appreciate everybody that signed up to the Patreon and checking that out. So check that out. Uh, dropping this podcast on a Tuesday so I'll have my top three lock of the night candidates dropping for you guys later this evening make sure you guys check that out but if you're also still looking for uh, predictions for the contender series uh, that goes down this evening it starts at 8pm Eastern you can find those breakdowns on this uh, on this YouTube channel it Was uh, I dropped it yesterday morning so make sure you guys check that out if you're still looking for some plays uh, hoping to cash another dog just as we did in the main event last week and Kareem Abdul Al or Abdul Kareem Al Sawad coming through as a plus 300 underdog for us let's see if we can keep the train rolling this weekend uh big shout out to godzilla wins for giving your boy a platform to drop written articles 
Wednesdays, we do the main event uh, breakdown. And Thursdays, we do the three best money line spots. You can check out the Godzilla Ones articles in the description below. As soon as we post them, I put the link below. So if you're looking for that, make sure you check it out. And if you're looking for breakdowns for any sport, Godzilla Wins is definitely one of the top spots to check out. So check out their website as well. All right. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into the breakdowns. And again, we're trying to be a little bit more efficient with these breakdowns so we can bring down the runtime on these podcasts. For your viewing pleasure, first fight of the night, we got Sung Woo Choi going up against Jarno Ahrens. Very intriguing matchup here between uh, 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 the Korean fighter who's on a little bit of a slump right now. He's 0-3 over his last three fights. He's gotten finished in two of those matchups, most recently by Mike Trezano. Uh, that was a fight where it was complete chaos for four or so minutes before Trezano was able to put him out. But uh, Choi seemed to be slowing down and his durability is taking a big impact as well. Even in the fight that he lost by decision to Koulibao, he was getting dropped left, right, and center in that matchup as well. He needs to tighten up that striking defense a little bit. But that's his bread and butter. Is his striking. The Muay Thai, the kickboxing. He loves going out there and throwing combinations and ending off with kicks. He has a nasty lead left hook that he can land on his opponents. But he leaves himself open to being hit. He also has a little bit of a concern in the grappling realm. Which is something that Jarno Aarons might be able to take full advantage of in this spot. Aarons comes from a judo background. He's a black belt in judo. But also has some decent power in his hands too. He made his short notice UFC debut back in September last year when he came in against William Gomez in a fight that was put together I believe two weeks before the card was even supposed to set to take place uh, Aaron's uh, not training out of a big gym or anything like that but like I said has some decent power has some good uh, experience on the regional scene as well so that's something to keep an eye on but I think his big power and grappling advantage in this matchup will allow him to swing the upset against the Korean fighter here I'm a big Choi fan but I think he's in some trouble here against Aaron's who was actually closer to plus 210 earlier in the week now he's closing in on that plus 140 plus 150 range seems like the public is liking him as well as do I so I'm going to go with Jarnal Aaron's to kick off this card with an upset next up we got Na or Liang Na going up against JJ Aldrich. Very intriguing matchup here between a striker and a grappler. Liang Na kind of fights like Rene Silva, who competed last week, but she's not as effective. She's had 25 professional MMA fights, 24 of them have finished inside the distance. Of those 24, 20 of them have only have finished in the first round. She is a die or get carried out on her shield type of fighter. She uh, leaves herself very open in the striking room, throws a lot of heavy big shots, wide whoop, looping shots that can be uh, countered very effectively by much better strikers. Once she gets fights to the ground though, she's very aggressive in terms of getting into dominant positions and looking for finishes. That's where she does her best work. Unfortunately for her, she's not been able to get it done in her two UFC fights thus far last time around getting knocked out by Silvana Gomez Juarez who has had some notoriously bad takedown defense in the past and Leong was struggling to get her to the mat there JJ Aldrich she's on a two-fight losing streak of her own but I think she has the chops to go out there and uh, anticipate the takedowns that are coming for Leong and counter effectively to try to find that knockout victory of her own it's been a long time since JJ Aldrich has gotten a finish I believe it's coming in on seven or eight years at this point in time but this is the perfect matchup where or not, not Leong uh, or Leong Na kind of uh, serves her chin up on a silver platter for a lot of her opponents to take advantage of and I think that's what JJ Aldrich is going to be able to do here she's a far technical or far better technical striker and even though she came up short again in her last matchup against Ariane Lipsky I really thought it was that early shot that Lipsky landed on Aldrich that wobbled her that rendered her defenseless for the rest of the matchup but i expect her to come back pretty strong here especially trying to bounce back off this two fight losing streak i expect her to stop the takedowns utilize her footwork and her combinations to open up the striking and eventually find that knockout over leong i like the under two and a half here again leong is a finish or b finish machine whereas aldrich is a decision machine however i feel like the openings that leong leaves will be able or aldrich will be able to capitalize on those and get her first finish in years so give me jj aldrich to get the win here next up we got a welterweight matchup between billy goff and yusako kinoshita very intriguing matchup here between um 
two guys coming off the contender series, or uh, at least Goff is coming off the contender series from last year, where he got a big win over Shimon Smotritsky, uh, a fight that he got hurt very early in, but managed to battle back in the same round and get the finish in the same round too. This guy has slick striking, good combinations, but also a background in wrestling, so he can take fights to the ground when he needs to and do some good work from there. He's a double champ from the CES promotion, which is from the Northeast uh, United States, uh, but he's faced some decent competition on that scene which has gotten him ready to make it to the UFC on the flip side for Kinoshita he had a tremendous performance on the contender series that earned him a UFC contract but unfortunately he ran into Adam Fugit in his UFC debut and got uh, finished in the first round of their matchup it seemed like Fugit had the grappling advantage but also had some power that Kinoshita was not ready for and he was able to hurt Kinoshita over and over again eventually getting that ground and pound finish with some beautiful elbows I fully expect Billy Goff to take advantage of the grappling edge he should have in this fight and Kinoshita might have some uh, tricks up his sleeve in terms of the jiu-jitsu that he brings to the table but I don't think he's ready to get hit and then taken down the way that Billy Goff has been able to do it against past opponents obviously I have a little bit of concern in terms of Goff's durability but he hasn't been finished in a long time but I still believe that Kinoshita has that weird karate striking style that could give him some issues um, I'm actually going to go with Goff here, though. I feel like he can utilize his striking to blend in his wrestling behind it and take home a decision victory in the spot. Uh, not something I feel overly confident in because I've been a pretty big on Kinoshita in the past, but I don't want to swing too far off the pendulum here, uh, even after losing his last fight uh, as a big favorite. But I still feel he's going to be in for a rough night here against a very good overall fighter in Billy Goff. Next up, sticking with the welterweights, we're going to go to Song Kanang going up against Rolando Bedoya. Very intriguing matchup here between two strikers. Song Kanong is on a two-fight losing streak. And last time around, he almost gave Ian Machado Gary his first professional loss. But Gary was able to recover from getting hurt early in that matchup. Had some good work in that same round as well, but then ended up taking over in the second and finishing Kanon in the third round. That's on the back end of two straight losses now for Kanon, who also got knocked out by Max Griffin before that. And it seems like he's trying to find the missing piece. You know, going into the Machado Gary fight, he was training over at Team Alpha Male. But after that, about a month after that loss, he actually moved over to Kill Cliff FC and he's trying to get some good work in with those guys to try to save his UFC roster spot. He's a striker. He has good power, good combinations, but I feel like he's a guy that can go out there and get outworked at this point. And he's going to get outworked by a guy in Rolando Bedoya, who trains out of the same training camp as Charles Oliveira. This guy moves forward and throws big power shots and loves to put the pressure on his opponents. He gave a lot of respect to Chaos Williams last time around as a big underdog. However, still had a pretty good performance even in coming up short by split decision that night. But we saw him still utilize some of his forward movement. Great kicking game to try to render uh, Chaos Williams uh, immobile that night. But he also throws big shots to the head as well. I expect him to tap into what got him so successful on the regional scene. And that's forward pressure and relentless combinations and uh, just forward movement. And I think that's what's eventually going to catch up to Kanan here. And I think we'll see Rolando Bedoya get his first UFC victory by knocking out Song Kanan. Probably in the second, maybe even third round. But I think that Bedoya is a star waiting to pop. He just needs a little bit more experience. And this was the perfect matchup for him to try to bounce back to or try to bounce back with. Next up in the middleweight division, going up a division here, we got Chidi Njikawani looking to bounce back after a two-fight losing streak. He's going up against Mihal Olegshejuk. Very fun matchup here between two different types of strikers. Obviously, we know Njikawani loves his Muay Thai, loves his knees, and loves his elbows, whereas Mihal Olegshejuk loves to march forward utilize his boxing combinations but he loves to work the body of his opponents obviously Chidi Njikawani has a little bit more tools in terms of utilizing his kicks and his knees which could give some problems to Oleg Shejuk uh, also the speed advantage of Chidi Njikawani could allow him to get ahead early in this matchup however I don't think Chidi does well with pressure and I think that's exactly what he's going to be facing here with Mihal as long as Mihal is able to survive the first three to four minutes of this matchup I feel like his body work and his forward pressure is going to start to catch up to end Jokowani, which will eventually lead to a finish for the pole fighter. Lord Mihal has been my one of my favorite fighters uh, in the UFC for a long time now, just because of his willingness to scrap and exchange inside the pocket. And at middleweight, this is the best division for him. And even though he's coming off of a loss to, against Kyle Bahayo, we know he doesn't do the greatest against grapplers. But even against a guy like Cody Brundage, we saw him show some improvements in terms of not giving up um, or not settling for bad positions and constantly working to get back to his feet. 
But obviously, we know there's a huge difference between Kyle Bahayo and Cody Brundage. Bohayo is far better at control, which is why he was able to get that submission over Oleg Shejuk. But I don't think Oleg Shejuk's going to have to worry about any of that here, as Chidiyan Jaquani is more of a striker than he is a grappler. So let me look forward to this matchup because I'm super excited for it. But I'm actually going to go with the poll here. I feel like Oleg Shejuk will break Njaquani and then find that finish in the second or third round. Next up bantamweights going at it here grapplers of sorts where we got toshiomi kazama going up against garrett armfield very intriguing fight here as both guys looking to get their first win inside the ufc kazama had his a road to ufc finale come to an end pretty quickly as rinyu nakamura who fights later on in this card was able to knock him out within 30 seconds of that fight kazama is a bjj black belt and utilizes that approach very effectively he loves to crash the pocket doesn't really have a lot of technique to his striking but does whatever it takes to try to get fights to the ground he doesn't mind pulling guard if he needs to because he has a nasty x card sweep that he seems to implement more often than not to end up on the back of his opponent or even in that top position where he can start working and looking for the dominant position required to get his hand raised like i said though his striking still needs a lot of work he leaves a lot of openings for himself especially if he's unable to get the takedown on the flip side for garrett armfield garrett armfield is a guy that came in on short notice against david onama last year up a weight class and was not doing too bad in the first round of that fight but it seemed like the power strength advantage of david onama ended up being too much for him which is when he was able to get the submission there armfield has a bit of a wrestling background but is a traditionally well-rounded mixed martial artist he trains out of Killcliffe FC, has a ton of great skills, but I'd say his boxing is his best trait about him. Actually, I'd say his ability to mix his striking with his grappling is the best trait about him. He does such a good job of forcing guys to strike with him, and then he's able to change levels and get them to the ground. I don't know if he's going to want to do that here against Kazama. What I think he's going to be doing is using, is using his uh, grappling defensively keeping this fight upright so that he can utilize his speed and striking advantage to really damage Kazama on the feet uh, and possibly even look for a finish there. I think it's going to be hard for him to truly commit to uh, much of a, a striking game, but I think the openings that are going to be left for him will be more than enough for him to take advantage of, land a couple strikes, and that accumulative damage will start to catch up with the Kazama, and I think that we'll see Armfield eventually get the finish here to get his hand raised by knockout. Moving over to the heavyweight division, we got Waldo Cortez Acosta going up against Lukas Dreski. Uh, intriguing matchup here between two strikers, but I can't really understand the hate that Waldo Cortez continues to get or Waldo Cortez Acosta continues to get. Like, I get it. He's a big favorite, um, but uh, I just see nothing but hate for him whenever I hear other people talk about him. Like, he, he is a solid striker. You know, he's in pretty damn good shape for a guy at heavyweight of his size. Uh, he has great cardio to go a hard 15 minutes if he needs to. He has a slick and crisp jab to really hurt his opponents from distance and just stay on that uh, that gas, that volume, uh, which makes it very hard for his opponents to get much damage off in return. Obviously, he took his first professional loss last time around when he came up short against uh, Hagerio, Marcos Hagerio de lima who was able to utilize a very solid leg kicking game to slow down cortez acosta and then really take him to the ground and win the first two fights but we saw de lima really start to slow down in the third round where cortez acosta was able to start to get to his jab utilize his volume and i think he outstruck him in that round 43 to 17 just showing that he can go a hard three rounds hard if he needs to uh, so I think that, you know, as long as he works on his or continues to work on his takedown defense and ability to work back to his feet, which he was doing well in the Delima fight, he just wasn't doing enough of it and quickly enough. But if he can speed up the process of working back to his feet after getting taken down, he's going to be very difficult to deal with for a lot of heavyweights. Uh, he's still only 31 years old, so we can expect to see more improvements for him as he continues to work through his career. His opponent, Dresky, this weekend is on a two-fight losing streak since joining the UFC after the Contender Series, and he had a pretty good showing against Martin Budai, even in a loss, but he got completely out-wrestled and outworked by Carl Williams earlier this year, year when he was unable to get much offense off as he continuously get got taken down to the ground. I've, I've always thought that Dresky is not as good as a guy that could actually make it to the 
UFC. His regional run was very skeptical considering the level of competition he was going up against and then also just the way that he was beating them and even the guy that he ended up losing to on the uh, regional scene just wasn't that great either. His takedown defense is lacking and his he has good volume and decent uh, striking on the feet but I think he's going to struggle against a guy who gets the basics down as well as Waldo Cortez Acosta. The line is a little wide here so I'll say that for sure because if Dreski comes out with a grapple heavy approach he could have some success and make this fight look closer than it actually is. So I'll actually wait on this line because I feel like there's going to be some more Dresky love coming in here, which could give us a solid line on Cortez Acosta, maybe closer to that minus 170, minus 180 range. At the time of this recording, he's roughly around that minus 240, minus 250 range, and I have no problem passing on this matchup if it continues to stick around that line but i still think that cortez acosta gets back to his winning ways gets back to doing what he does best and really putting volume and pressure on his opponents with his jab give me cortez acosta to win by decision Sticking with the heavyweights we move on to the next matchup here between junior tafa and parker porter Junior Taffa, obviously, the younger brother of Ju uh, Justin Taffa. And Junior actually came up short in his first UFC fight earlier this year when he uh, was grinded out by Mohamed Usman. Uh, Taffa comes from a striking background and it seemed like he couldn't get anything going against Usman and he started to slow down in the third fourth fifth minute of this fight which allowed Usman to really close the distance and get his grappling going and put him through the ringer he wore on Taffa and Taffa's knockout power evaporated pretty quickly which left him pretty much you know he couldn't do anything we're talking about a guy that made his UFC debut less than a year after making his professional MMA debut. The only reason he is getting this jump to the UFC is as he's the brother of Junior or Justin Taffa, but also had a decent striking background, but still nothing amazing either. I, I, I really don't get it. I don't get what's so good about this guy and why people continue to back him. Although he does have a decent matchup here in Parker Porter, a guy that he could have an early speed advantage against and potentially find the knockout against. But Porter is a guy that really rejuvenated his career last time around. And even though it was a win over Braxton Smith, a guy who's no longer in the UFC, Porter dropped a solid 10 to 15 pounds. Looks like he's in better shape and trying to utilize that and translate that into uh, solid UFC wins for him. He was on a two-fight losing, losing streak against guys like Jaelton, Ameda, and Justin Taffa. But Justin, you know, caught him with, you know, a shot where uh, Parker Porter really was kind of just being lackadaisical. He tried cutting an angle, but he left his hands down and left it open for Justin to take full advantage of that. I fully expect a guy with the amount of experience and fight IQ as Porter has, he will learn from that and ensure that he doesn't make that mistake again. But I think that he has the chops to go out there and put uh, Tafa through the ringer here. I think he can grind on him. I think he can have some success up against the cage, trying to land some takedowns, doing some good work from on top, even landing some good strikes of his own, even some kicks of his own. It's just that first two to three minutes of this matchup is going to be very tough for him dealing with the knockout power of Tafa. But there's no way I'm paying chalk on a guy as inexperienced as Tafa. I'd rather take a shot on the underdog here in Parker Porter, who has... You know, what is that? Five. Uh, so Tafa has five professional fights. Uh, Porter has 22 professional fights. So we're talking about over four times the amount of uh, MMA experience as Tafa. And a guy that's not too shabby on the ground either when he gets the, gets the fights there. So give me uh, Porter here. I think he can grind this one out. And I also wouldn't be surprised if he's actually able to pull off a, submit, uh, 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 a finish or even a submission at some point. But I think we're going to see him take that grueling, slow grind on top of here and win this fight by decision. Next up, probably the most important matchup on this entire card, which goes down in the flyweight division between Aaron Blanchfield and Tyler Santos. Obviously, Blanchfield is looking to earn her first UFC title shot, whereas Tyler Santos is coming off of her first title shot, where she lost a split decision against Valentina Shevchenko. She performed very well that night as she landed, I believe, uh, three takedowns that night and was able to accrue close to nine minutes of control time against a champion. That had been the most adversity we'd seen Shevchenko face since being the champion down at flyweight but obviously we know alexa grasso was able to defeat her earlier this year to earn that strap but i think that tyler santos was right there in terms of springing the upset she's very strong in the clinch and she does a great job in terms of taking her opponents to the ground and grinding them out from a top position she has good striking as well where she throws in combinations but it seems like more often than not she's leaning on dragging her opponents to the mat and doing what she does from that top position on the flip side for Aaron Blanchfield she's on a very hot run right now as well most recently defeating Jessica Andrade and finishing her pretty emphatically in the second round of their matchup that was the night that Aaron was actually supposed to fight Tyler for the first time but that did not end 
up transpiring, hence Andrade coming in on short notice. Blanchfield is very, very difficult to deal with when she's able to get opponents to the ground. She uh, passes guard very well. She establishes top control, uh, and it makes it very difficult for opponents to find any success off their back or even ways to work back to their feet. And I think that uh, could be what we end up seeing here uh, against Tyler Santos. Santos might be stronger, but I think that Blanchfield will do a good enough job with her technique and discipline to establish those, uh, top that dominant control and that dominant positioning she needs to grind out Tyler Santos in this spot. Uh, again, it's a close fight. I see a lot of people riding the coattails right now of Aaron Blanchfield because of that dominant victory over Jessica Andrade. But let's not forget how good Tyler Santos as well she's very difficult to deal with and she's a very strong woman but i just feel like blanchfield is a little bit more tuned in technically speaking and that could be the uh the difference maker in this spot so i'm going to go blanchfield and blanchfield by decision but it's going to be a grueling grueling fight for bro both women Next up, one of the top prospects takes center stage here in the bantamweight division as we got Rinya Nakamura going up against Fernie Garcia. Nakamura has a lifelong background in mixed martial arts but has focused on wrestling throughout his career. He won the gold in 2017 and bronze in 2018 and was prepping to prepare for or prepping to participate in the 2020 Olympics before the COVID pandemic hit. That's when he decided to hang up the singlet and take on mixed martial arts, and he hasn't looked back since. He's on his 7-0 run since turning professional, and he's finished at all but one of his opponents. Last time around, he earned the Road to UFC, road to UFC uh, Tournament Champion, if that's what you want to call it, by knocking out uh, Toshiomi uh, Kazuma in the first round of their fight. I think it was only 30 seconds. But he does a great job with his wrestling, as you would expect. But he's improving his striking as well, where he throws a lot of big power and explosivity into his shots, which normally crumple his opponents. His opponent this week, and Fernie Garcia, is technically speaking a slicker striker, especially in the boxing realm, and he could take advantage of some of the openings that Nakamura leaves in the striking realm. However, I think Kazama will be successful in taking this fight to the ground, a spot in which Fernie Garcia has struggled with in the past, most recently against Brady Heastand. But if he was struggling against Brady, he's going to struggle even more here against Rinya, who should be able to get this fight to the ground without too much issue and do big damage from on top, where I expect him to get a finish within the first two rounds. So give me Rinya Nakamura to dominate and continue his reign of uh, success uh, through Fernie Garcia. I can't wait till this guy starts fighting ranked opponents, but he's uh, still pretty young, 28 years old, uh, but I expect him to just dominate this weekend. Give me Nakamura inside the distance, uh, the under two and a half, probably what I like the most, considering it's, you know, better than taking Nakamura, um, you know, uh, obviously his money line, but I fully expect violence to come through in this matchup. All right, next up, we're going to be talking about a featherweight matchup between the returning Giga Chikadze, who hasn't seen action since January of 2022, where Calvin Cater just put the absolute shit kicking on this guy. Uh, he's going up against Alex Kersir, who's on a career best run right now, 7-1 and one over his last eight fights. Last time around for Giga Chikadze, he dealt with a grapple-heavy approach from Cater, who was able to do a great job in terms of stifling the power and explosivity of Chikadze, wearing on Chikadze, and then reaping the fruits of his, fruits of his labor in the following rounds as he was able to outstrike and outdamage Giga, who was just really slowed down and really just caught off guard by the approach of Cater earlier in that matchup. Um, that, you know, put a stop to the winning streak that Chikadze had where Chikadze looked unstoppable. He was able to knock out uh, guys like Cub Swanson and uh, Edson Barboza in emphatic fashion, but then when he finally found, fought somebody that was as complete as uh, Cater, uh, he ended up coming up short. He's going up against Alex Caceres here, who I said is in his best form to date, even though he's 35 years old at this point in time. He's on a two-fight winning streak. Even uh, if you include the Sadiq Yusuf loss that he took three fights ago, he's on a 7-1 and one run over his last eight fights. He's finishing guys left and right. He's looking very good. He's looking more confident than we've ever seen him before. He has a very unorthodox striking style where he darts in and out from outside, utilizes long ra rangey combinations, but also has a nasty jujitsu game where he's been able to get a, a couple of submission victories in this run as well. And I think that unorthodox movement mixed in with the grappling advantage I expect Caceres to have in this fight probably will catch um, 
Chikadze off guard. Uh, excuse me, I was trying to either swallow or or yawn there. I don't know what was coming up, but regardless, uh, I think Caceres' complete game and his experience and his activity level recently will be an advantage coming in against a guy who might have a ton of ring rust like Giga Chikadze, but also a guy that, you know, he might have had a good run, but I don't know if he's as good as people are making him out to be. The fact that we can get Alex Caceres close to plus 210 in this fight, I think is crazy. I think we'll see uh, Caceres do a great job in terms of um, stifling the early power of Chikaze and then doing big work of his own from that top position and possibly even finding a submission uh, of his own. Um, I'm, the the official prediction is going to be Caceres by decision, but I feel like we'll see really good work done from Caceres overall. That will open up plenty of opportunities for himself. And uh, again, the first round going to be tough, but if he can work through that, get away from the big kicking game of Chikaze, he should be able to take over and get his hand raised. I'm going to take him at, uh, as a big underdog here at plus 210 to pull off the upset. All right, that brings us to our co-main event of the evening, which is actually a rematch between Anthony Smith and Ryan Spann in the light heavyweight division. Anthony Smith came up victorious the last time that they were scheduled against each other, where he was able to get the, I believe it was a rear naked choke or a triangle choke. Yeah, it was a triangle choke that, um, sorry, was it a triangle choke? I think it was a rear naked choke. Either way, he submitted it. You know, he he threw down with Ryan Spann. He landed big shots. He hurt him on multiple occasions and then eventually submitted him. There was a lot of heat going into that matchup as Anthony Smith felt disrespected about the lack of respect that Ryan Spann was showing him. And he was able to, you know, really put it on him and showcase that he uh, deserved that respect. Uh, recently, Anthony Smith, two-fight losing streak, uh, got finished by Magomed on Kalaev, and then obviously didn't have the best performance against Johnny Walker. But I fully expect him to have his confidence back here, especially as he's especially as he's facing a guy he has already previously defeated. Ryan Spann, he went on a two-fight winning streak after losing to Anthony Smith, finishing Iwan Kuitilaba and Dominic Reyes, but earlier this year got submitted by Nikita Krylov. The one thing that I'm finding with guys that are able to beat Ryan Spann are guys that are willing to throw down with him in the pocket in that first round. Ryan Spann is a first-round machine. This guy has a ton of finishes in that first round, and I believe eight out of his ten fights in the UFC have finished under one and a half rounds, which is probably going to end up being my favorite prop for this matchup. But I think that we'll see um, uh, Anthony Smith bring in the same type of confidence that he had in the first fight, be willing to exchange in the pocket with Ryan Spann, look for that big shot to hurt Spann, take him to the ground, and work for that submission just as he did last time around. So Spann, again, always dangerous early, but I think that Smith has the veterancy, experience, and confidence confidence to go out there and exploit Span just as he did in the first fight so give me Smith as the dog which I find absolutely crazy considering this fight you know happened like two years ago not much has changed other than some of the momentum that either of these guys are on but I don't think that Smith is that far removed from being able to do what he did last time around so give me Smith by sum submission but under one and a half probably the best way to go about it and that brings us to our main event of the evening between Max Holloway and the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung in a featherweight matchup. Like I said at the top of the show, both guys are trying to find their footing in the featherweight division. Uh, Max Holloway is coming off of a victory over Arnold Allen earlier this year, but he's dropped three straight or three fights to Alexander Volkanovsky, which means he likely won't get another shot at the featherweight strap unless he puts like another godlike run, just as he did after the second time that he defeated or, or was defeated by Volkanovsky. On the flip side for Chan Sung Jung, he hasn't competed in over, uh, I believe it's 16 months now uh, after. Uh, Alexander Volkanovsky absolutely destroyed him last year. Now we got to put it with a little bit of grain and salt considering that Chan Sun Yung came in as a short notice replacement that night. So maybe we can give him the benefit of the doubt there. But he's 30, uh, is he 36? I think he's 36 or 38. 36 years old. But we know that there's a huge and obvious skill discrepancy between him and the top of the division. And that's exactly what he's facing here in a guy in Max Holloway who will more than likely be able to put the pressure on him, utilize that classic Max Holloway style, put volume, put output, put all of that together. Chan Sung Yun can still crack, but as long as Max Holloway's durability is still top-notch and elite level, just as we've always seen throughout his fights, he should be able to deal with that uh, striking style of Chan Sung Yun and come back with his own offense and, uh, and pressure. Uh, the over-under was set at 2.5 earlier this week, and it got absolutely steamed up to about minus 290. I'm sure they're going to switch the uh, widely available to total to 3.5 or 4.5, but I do expect this fight to go the full distance. These two guys are notoriously known for their crazy 
crazier durability and their crazy cardio. And I feel like Holloway will be able to utilize that to go on to win a decision victory. Before recording this, I saw that decision prop for Max Holloway sitting around the plus 165 range, which I think is a perfect entry spot to take Holloway rather than taking the minus 800. I fully expect him to go out there and utilize a good decision style game, volume, pressure, punches, just stay in his face do what max holloway does best and i feel like he has a lot to prove in terms of still realizing that he's a top featherweight in the world he's still only 31 years old and he can do it against the perfect stylistic matchup that he adds here against the korean zombie so give me max holloway to win by decision and i think he makes it look like max holloway always does he might drop a round but for the most part he's going to do what he does best and win at least four of these rounds en route to a decision victory and there you guys go breakdowns on all 13 fights for this ufc singapore car reminder it takes place 8 p or 4 a.m eastern time is the first prelim 8 a.m eastern is the first main card fight don't get caught napping if you want to catch this card live i'm looking forward to it i love morning cards nothing i love more than coffee and combat together so i'm very much looking forward to that reminder road to ufc goes down sunday morning and if you're looking for breakdowns for that mat or for those 10 matchups you can find out the breakdowns find the breakdowns on my patreon i'm stumbling through the last little bit here i apologize Breakdowns for Road to UFC and PFO, which goes down Wednesday on the Patreon. Link in the description below. And I'll be back on Sunday to, or sorry, I'll be back throughout this whole week to drop the segments that you guys have come to love. But I'll also be back on Sunday to drop the Contender Series Week 4 Breakdowns. Appreciate all the love and support as always. Drop it, like, and subscribe if you haven't already. Drop a comment below. Let me know what you think about the breakdowns. And good luck this week. I will see you guys throughout the week. Peace. Last thing, but... <laughs>